Hi, I'm Andrew, and this is Keen on Democracy. A chill is enveloping the world. Everywhere I go these days, the conversation is the same. Everyone is fearful about the fate of democracy in our digital age. The same worried question is on all of our lips. What or who is killing democracy? Everybody wants to know. There's certainly no lack of suspects. Trump, Putin's trolls, Mark Zuckerberg, authoritarian populism, the wall, Victor Urban, fake news, Brexit, Bolsonaro, surveillance capitalism, Erdogan, Twitter, or, last but certainly not least, the president of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping. So what's up with democracy these days? Is it really dying? Or is it simply shedding its industrial analog skin and updating itself for our networked digital age? That's the subject of this podcast series. This is a show featuring conversations about the most important issue of our age with some of the world's most incisive thinkers. I hope it both provokes and enlightens. So is democracy in crisis? Yes, at least according to last week's guest, Betaworks CEO John Borthwick. Today's guest, however, disagrees. David Goodhart is the author of the controversial 2017 bestseller, The Road to Somewhere, a sharp critique of ruling class liberalism and a spirited defense of populism. So when I caught up with Goodhart in London at his Westminster office overlooking the British Houses of Parliament, I asked him why, in his opinion at least, contemporary Western democracy remains in a quite healthy state. David Goodhart, head of the Demography Unit at London Policy Exchange and the author of the very controversial book, The Road to Somewhere. Is democracy in crisis? No, I don't think democracy is in crisis at all. I think democracy is working quite well. I mean, what we've been experiencing recently is a kind of pushback against the dominant political paradigm of the preceding 30 years or so. Liberal economics and social and cultural liberalism have been utterly dominant and to the dissatisfaction of quite large minorities, if not majorities, in many developed countries. And we're seeing a kind of rebalancing. We're seeing a pushback against that and sometimes takes you know, uncomfortable or ugly forms. But most of the time, I think the departure from mainstream liberalism is also done within a broadly liberal outlook. In this book that you mentioned, The Road to Somewhere, I talk about the people that see the world from anywhere, the more mobile, highly educated people who value openness. and People like us. You and people I. like us, yeah. And who find social change easy to surf and, you know, who are happy about high levels of immigration and so on, tend to have quite weak group attachments. And they're, they're a big minority. They're 20%, 25%, even 30% of the population. Then you have the other people, the people that see the world from somewhere, tend to be much more rooted and less well-educated and value security and familiarity, tend to have much stronger group attachments and see social change often as loss. Now, I think Essentially, our governments have been representing the interests of anywheres for the last 25 or 30 years. The global elite, the new It's not just the elite. It's not just the elite. I mean, we're talking about, like I say, 25, 30% of the population. We're talking about anywheres and somewheres are both subdivided into sort of subsections. And there is a kind of elite section of anywheres, you know, the global villagers, the citizens of the world, you might say, the people at the top of big international organizations and companies and so on. But no, I mean, you know, the anywhere worldview is completely legitimate, as is the somewhere worldview at least in their mainstream forms. But it's just that one of them has been completely dominant and I think has not been aware of its domination. And it has become a lot more aware of it, I think, rather belatedly as a result of Brexit and Trump. So perhaps let me rephrase the question. Rather than a crisis of democracy, is there a crisis of liberal democracy or liberalism within democratic thought, the kind of what you would call perhaps the ideology of the everywheres? Well, I don't think it's a crisis. I think, as I say, it's a kind of reordering of the Well, they're not happy the about it, balance. David, are they? I mean, there's a lot of talk that populism is undermining democracy. They're fearful of Brexit. They're fearful of Trump. They're fearful of yeah. what people call the new authoritarianism in Eastern Europe. Yeah. And I think there is a lot of hyperbole attached to these changes. You know, there are one or two areas of anxiety, but on the whole, I think this is a healthy and legitimate rebalancing 
the top 25% do not own the whole society and they sometimes behave or have behaved. And what is more? Why? Because they're arrogant? Because they're blind to the rest of the, the yes. 75%? They've run economics, you know, the knowledge economy is, you know, works for people who are highly educated. They've run politics and increasingly... Give me some names, David. Well, typical meritocracy. Who are they? The Tony Blairs? The Tony Margaret Blair, Matthews, but it crosses Bill party. Bill Clinton. George Osborne. Yeah, I mean, Bill Clinton. A lot of this goes back to, I mean, you know, this extraordinary run that liberalism has had really begins with the fall of the Berlin Wall, late 80s, early 90s. So the end of history kind of discourse. And really, crucially, it's when the centre-left essentially accepts the new terms of globalisation, accepts the Thatcher-Reagan compromise. So the Clinton-Blair compromise. Yeah, and... and you know, Robert Reich, you know, who's, who's about as left-wing as you get in kind of mainstream Certainly in America. liberal politics, pre-Bernie Sanders. And, you know, he wrote this book called The Work of Nations, which is essentially saying we have to roll with globalization. But don't worry, because we are going to look after you, you know, addressing the kind of traditional blue-collar base of parties of the centre-left, saying, look, it's all right, you know, we're going to retrain you all for technician jobs or whatever it was. And that simply didn't happen. It didn't happen here. It didn't happen in America. The one place it did happen was Germany, because you cannot make people unemployed in Germany because of their co-determination works council. Or Scandinavia as well. Scandinavia. All of these changes happen much more slowly in those countries. Nonetheless, having said that, you know, we've just seen, you know, the emergence of Sweden Democrats in Sweden. We have a very powerful populist party in Denmark. Populists have been in power briefly, or, or part of coalitions in Norway and Finland. So... I think it's wrong to stress the economic factors here too much. It's true you've had wage stagnation, particularly in America, much less so actually in Europe. And you've had growing inequality, again, much more in the US than here. I don't think this is primarily an economic thing, although economic and cultural things are often... At what point did the somewheres turn against the anywheres? Was it because of the failure of globalization for them to keep up with jobs? Was it over symbolic events like Brexit or, or the Trump election? I think it's a host of factors, really. I think it's just gradually you know, seeing society change, seeing the kind of terms of trade of society turning against you gradually over time. The main party that people like you used to vote for, the main party of the centre-left being completely taken over by liberal graduates is another huge factor in this. So the decline of unions? The decline of unions, the decline of other kind of forms of full-time uh, job of, of identity and respect you might say class politics the yes i mean i think actually curiously enough if you kind of look at the opinion data on socioeconomic factors you know different classes and indeed value groups have been kind of converging around a kind of sort of mixed economy centrism the where we've been diverging is on sort of cultural and national issues related to things like immigration and open v closed i think a very self-regarding alternative to left v right. I mean, you know, Tony Blair made a speech you know, a few years ago saying, you know, open v closed is the new left v right. Well, I've never met anybody who wants to live in a closed society, but a lot of people think that the forms of openness that we've had have not been working in their interests. To add insult to injury, I think a lot of people have felt caricatured by the kind of angry liberals, as it were, who, you know, post-Brexit, post-Trump, who have been briefly unseated from their positions of complete dominance in, you know, in the economy and society and culture, and who have blamed their political opponents by telling them they're xenophobic and that their views are unacceptable. There are xenophobes, you know, amongst the kind of somewhere classes, but the vast majority I would call decent populists, meaning that they accept most of the, what one might call the great liberalization of the last 30 or 40 years on race, on gender, on sexuality. You know, you only have to go back as recently as the kind of late 80s and, you know, very large majorities of people in Britain and America thought that homosexuality was wrong. And quite large minorities, if not majorities, thought that the interracial marriage was wrong until surprisingly recently. We've had dramatic change on all those things. But that doesn't mean to say that people have become liberals. But the somewhere's got it right in terms of figuring out their enemy, because you're suggesting their enemy is really the meritocracy, the top 20, 25 percent. But aren't they focused on immigration and immigrants, seeing them as the enemy when, in fact, they're not really the threat? Why has this issue coalesced around immigration? Because of national social contracts, because the anywheres, like I said earlier, they're comfortable with openness. They benefit from quite high levels of immigration, both economically and to some extent culturally, you might say. Somewheres often don't benefit. That it's them that faces 
competition in labor markets. Give me some examples of where some wares don't benefit from immigration. Well, just greater competition over public resources. You know, when suddenly the area you're in, lots of East Europeans start turning up. Particularly if you're older and you're not used to social change, suddenly the streets fill up with Polish shops and people speaking a language you don't understand. And there are longer queues for the, you know, the A&E or to see the GP. I mean, I think liberals often talk about, you know, such and such is anti-immigrant. A xenophobic minority of three, five percent may be anti-immigrant. The vast majority... In the UK, then? Yeah. But probably not, at, not, in, not in parts of Europe. Um, I think even there, the vast majority of people are anti-immigration. It's not the same thing as being anti-immigrant. I mean, in London alone, we have about 16% of the workforce is from the European Union, just in the last few years. I mean, that represents huge changes in some of the outer suburbs of London. What, 40%, I think, of people working in the construction industry in London are born outside the UK. And... Last year, I think in the whole of the UK, we had about 10,000 construction apprenticeships starting. You asked for a concrete example. Actually, that's quite a good one. That sense that, you know, we're not training our own young people to do these jobs. Employers are taking the easy course and just taking somebody off and the shelf from And you think this debate between the somewheres and the anywheres, you think this is healthy for democracy? It's actually enriching democracy. It's just reflecting genuine conflicts of interest. And if you suppress those conflicts of interest, then... But we're not... Are we seeing new political parties built around this? Isn't that one of the problems is the political parties themselves are struggling? The traditional political parties are struggling to adapt. That is true. I think our parties are out of sync with this shift, as it were, from socioeconomic focus on politics, in which sort of social class was the main unit, the argument was sort of state v. market, you know, degrees of equality, scale of public spending and so on, moving from that to socio-cultural arguments becoming much more important. And the parties aren't really sort of equipped. You know, you have anywhere, somewhere divisions within both the main parties here. And both parties are very conflicted over Brexit. Yeah, and most of the new voices in politics have been the populist voices, and they have had a significant impact. But I don't think they're outside of the bounds of kind of legitimate democratic voices. I mean, I think there are illegitimate forms of populism, you know, Golden Dawn. There are kind of gangster populists. Golden Dawn in Greece. Yeah, I mean, they were essentially 1930s street fascists. They are clearly outside of democratic legitimacy and open racists. But the vast majority of populists, I think, are legitimate. In some cases, they've come from illegitimate to legitimate. It's the case with the Sweden Democrats. Because this party, 25 years ago, had neo-Nazis in it, that you're not able to change. So we want to continue to caricature. We don't say the same thing about people on the left. I mean, half of Tony Blair's cabinet had been Trotskyists in their 20s, but we think it's perfectly legitimate of them to sort of shift to a more mainstream centre-left. There's a kind of asymmetry in our tolerance of people moving. Like, the, you know, the Green Party in Germany, I mean, had very, very ultra-left roots. They were quite sympathetic to some of the sort of Bader-Meinhof movement. You are in danger then, if you use that argument, of becoming an apologist for the ADP or what's happening in Poland and Hungary. At what point does the shift towards this intolerant authoritarianism and disdain for democratic norms, at what point does that bother you in Hungary or well, Poland? Well, I don't really know enough about Hungary and Poland. I mean, and people say this is an example of the unacceptable face of the new populism, and maybe they're right. I mean, I would say Poland is a very, very divided society. From the little I know, I worry less about Poland than Hungary in a way, because Poland has got this kind of very divided kind of winner-takes-all system, so that when the right are in power, they try and sort of change the rules so that they can kind of permanently stay in power. But when the liberals are in power, they kind of do rather similar things. You have deeply embedded norms on both sides. They have their different newspapers, and they have their different political parties, obviously. So I think that in a way, there's a kind of mainly healthy competition, albeit when one of them is in power, they try and bend the rules so that they have a kind of more permanent advantage. And you might say that happens in, in other democracies too. I think it is slightly more complicated in the case of Hungary because Fidesz, you might say, is just too powerful. It's too big. It's almost a kind of monoculture politically. And what about Turkey? Turkey has never been a mainstream liberal democracy. But it's been more of a liberal it had a, democracy than it had an authoritarian it liberalism in the, you know, under the Kemalists. And it's now got an authoritarian liberalism, or, or possibly rather less liberal, under 
a kind of neo-Islamist. But doesn't the somewhereness of Erdogan trouble you? Not his somewhereness, no. I mean, you know, he's, I mean, I, again, I don't really know enough about it. He has this vendetta against the uh, Gulenites. I mean, I assume that most of the people who lost their jobs after the last attempted coup were supporters of Fatula Gulen, who were often described as a kind of state within the state. My, the kind of anywhere somewhere arguments apply much more, I think, to rich developed countries than to Russia or Turkey or China or elsewhere. How is technology, new technology, particularly the internet, how is that playing into the anywhere somewhere divide? I certainly think social media has exacerbated the value divides. It'd be interesting to kind of imagine the change without, I mean, the shift that we've seen, the Brexit Trump populist shift of the last period without social media, whether people, particularly liberals who are anxious about the change, might be less anxious if not for the kind of rather intemperate language that it's been expressed in on both sides, which undoubtedly has been exacerbated by social media. So it's changed the tone of politics. I don't think it would have changed the underlying story. I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're in a kind of slightly new territory. We, As you were saying earlier, the party political system hasn't yet adapted to the new divisions, the new forces in our society. But I think it'll sort of come round to doing so. As I was saying, I mean, I think there is what we've seen emerging in the last 10 or 15 years, perhaps, is I think the kind of hidden majority in liberal democracies, rich liberal democracies, has been, to paraphrase the famous Daniel Bell political credo, has essentially been people who are pro-market, editing Daniel Bell somewhat, pro-market social democrats in economics, liberals in politics, very broadly speaking, you know, they're in favour of the separation of powers, rule of law, individual rights, and so on. You know, Nigel Farage of UKIP is just as much of a liberal as Nick Clegg in that sense. All mainstream populists sign up to things that, you know, 100 years ago would have been seen as very liberal. So market-friendly social democrat in economics, liberal in politics, but somewhat conservative in social and cultural matters. And that is where somewheres and anywheres really diverge. And I think somewheres in this respect, you know, represent, as I say, a majority of feelings. And these are feelings and attitudes that have been disregarded. You are head of the demography unit at the London Policy Exchange. Isn't the split, though, demographic between young and old? Aren't there young people under 30, under 35? Aren't they intuitively anywheres? And the older you get, the more of a somewhere you become. There's some truth in that. Yeah, I mean, so there is a life cycle effect. You know, young people tend to be much more liberal about race, say, but then pretty well everybody except for the very old are now pretty liberal on race. But that, you know, being liberal on race doesn't necessarily mean that you believe in open borders. No one believes in open borders, do they? I mean, just people coming across without any checks. Is there anyone who actually believes that? Well, yes, there are quite influential people who believe in it, but it's true. I mean, it's not, no mainstream party does. You can kind of implicitly believe in open borders by not caring about illegal immigration. Say, lots of liberals in America say, well, so what? I mean, you know, I don't care if we have lots of... So they come over the border, they do our gardening, they make our burritos, and it's not a problem. But of course, if you might have been somebody who might have been doing that gardening for $10 an hour more, then it is a problem. This is what I was mentioning earlier about the fact that somewhere see national social contracts as existentially important to them. Anywheres, you know, who have greater opportunities, who can perhaps move around more internationally and are highly qualified, they're rarely going to be out of a professional job. They are much less attached to national social contracts. If we want to take that analogy, though, of the person doing the yard work in California being replaced by um, the quote-unquote illegal immigrant Isn't it true to say that most of the, again, quote, native people in America, they didn't want those jobs in the first place? They didn't want them at the pay they were being offered at. Absolutely. But most people are prepared to do, you know, difficult antisocial jobs if they're paid well enough. I mean, the example I always cite is the oil rigs. You know, working class people used to go out and work very happily on oil rigs. You know, you'd go out for two or three months at a time, earn a huge amount of money, you know, and then have a month off or whatever. I mean, if you can get somebody to do antisocial work at ordinary wage rates that your know, native worker is not going to do, then obviously that's an enormous boon for employers. So this is one of the reasons why it's so bizarre in a way that the left lines up on the side of the most ruthless employers when it comes to the immigration story. What do you mean? I mean, whenever I hear lefties talking about immigration, they're always, you know, they talk like employers. 
The left has led the world uh, to its great credit on issues of racial justice. I mean, it was the left that championed issues of racial justice, you know, back in the kind of civil rights period and before and since. But at the time, issues of racial justice were often tied up as open a possible door on immigration. And subsequently, I think most people have been able to sort of separate out the two issues. The issue of racial justice is not the same as the most open possible door on immigration, but many people on the left still think it is. And so they essentially take this side of employers. They want as much immigration as possible. They don't care because the left is essentially graduates now. So they're not competing for the gardening jobs or the lower skilled jobs. And they place the interests of openness and high immigration because of its historic association with racial justice. They place those interests above the interests, often of ethnic minority and black Americans. I mean, it always used to be the case that the unions, before they got taken over by kind of highly educated anywhere graduates, the unions and the mainstream black organizations in America were always against large-scale immigration because perfectly rationally it was not in their interests. Now, that will sort of change in the 80s and 90s. Do you think that the foundations of democracy will be strengthened if we can rethink meritocracy, the meritocratic values that have governed society over the last 50 years? Do you think they don't really work anymore and that that's what's weakening democracy? I do think that that is a big part of it. I think, you know, when we talk about this being about socio-cultural issues, not so much socio-economic issues, it isn't just to do with nationhood and immigration. So it is It is also to do, I think, with feelings of recognition and value and esteem. And I think, in a funny sort of way, industrial societies were better at distributing status than post-industrial societies that are based very much around cognitive ability as the main marker of esteem. Industrial society, for a start, industrial society did not destroy the preceding forms of value and the norms of everyday life. And I mean, religion, for example, was enormously strengthened by the creation of great urban centers, you know, Methodism and so on. And family life was actually, I mean, illegitimacy in 19th century England fell quite dramatically. You didn't have a kind of destruction of tradition and traditional norms, oddly enough, in, in industrial society, which you are getting now. I mean, in the shift from industrial to post-industrial societies, you're seeing the weakening of those institutions that give people recognition just for being who they are, regardless of what they've achieved in their lives. And that's bad for democracy. That is bad for society and therefore bad for democracy, I think, yeah. How does it manifest itself in anger, resentment? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the kind of Nietzsche's notion of kind of resentiment, I think, is a very powerful one now because we have societies that hold up the ideals of meritocracy, of equality, not economic, but most other forms of equality. Democracy is an enormously egalitarian thing because it, in the democratic sphere, we are all equal. You know, We all have one vote. Bill Gates has one vote and I have one vote. We all have one vote. This is something that kind of underlies some of the recent protest votes, you might call them. Brexit is a protest vote. Voting for Trump is a kind of protest vote. It's an expression of this conflict we have between the equality in the democratic political sphere and the huge increase in inequality. I don't mean just economic, although that has been a factor, particularly in the US, but I mean the, the, the kind of status inequality as other forms of life that gave people status, whether it was being, you know, breadwinner or homemaker in kind of socially conservative family terms, or again, America is exceptional here because it hasn't declined in status or heft, but I'm thinking of the military. The military used to, you know, be a great source of esteem and prestige to hundreds of thousands of young men. I mean, I think our armed forces are now down to 80,000 or something. I mean, a trivial number. You've seen the decline of religion. You've seen a lot of the other sources of status and prestige have weakened as everything has sort of focused on higher education and cognitive ability. So that we've got this conflict between the kind of inherent egalitarianism of democracy versus this great gulf in status. Somebody wrote me a letter who read this book I wrote about the value divides, the anywhere, somewhere value divides, and said that a good society has a balance between the head, the hand, and the heart. Now, I know that it sounds a little bit new agey, but actually I think there's great wisdom in that. And I think we've shifted so much in the last 20 or 30 years into one of those H's, the head. We've diminished the status and indeed the pay associated with skilled labor. And heart, 
when he talked about heart, I mean, he meant the labour market aspect of it, talking about how those jobs that require emotional intelligence to do well, whether it's sort of teaching young children, whether it's working in social care, working as a nurse, with people who are frightened and going through difficult operations, or whatever, those kinds of aptitudes, we simply don't value enough. And in political terms, that's being manifested by the angry male who's being left behind. Is that fair? I think that's a bit of a caricature. I mean, I think it's, you know, it was certainly one of the sort of faces of the new politics. Yes, the people in the old industrial regions, who's, you know, the promise of the new Democrats, the promise of Robert Reich, it's all right, we're going to retrain you as technicians. The promise of Tony Blair's new Labour, you know, all those people in the former mining areas of the UK, it's all right, we're going to retrain you. It simply didn't happen. It really didn't happen. And they ended up working in call centres or whatever. You know, this is where kind of economic and cultural things are, are very closely wound up together. Because I do think one of the huge factors underlying so much of the discontent has been the huge reduction in the status of non-graduate employment. There are still some highly skilled manual employment. There's, you know, technical jobs that are often well paid and give people status. But quite a large part of the kind of bottom half of the labor market used to provide jobs that made people, particularly men, feel proud about themselves. The dignity of labor. I mean, it kind of sounds a kind of anachronism just to say the phrase now. But not that long ago, people thought in those terms, and now they don't. And I think that decline in the status of non-graduate employment has been a huge factor. Hi, my name is Steffi Czerny, and I'm the founder of the DLD Conferences. DLD is short for Digital Life Design and explores how the digital age fundamentally changes our world. Founded in Munich in 2005, DLD is now a globally connected community of thinkers, doers, and communicators. We host conferences in Munich, New York, Tel Aviv, Singapore, and Brussels. And we are very proud of our interdisciplinary outlook and even more so of our track record of discovering trend topics early on. Andrew Keen is a long-time, long-term DLD friend who has done many interviews at DLD conferences. If you like this podcast, you should join one of our events. The next one coming up is DLD Munich Conference, taking place on January 19th to 21st, 2019. Our motto for this year is optimism and courage. We want to put a really positive spin on recent technological developments from AI through blockchain to quantum computing and discuss which impact they have on business as well as politics and society. We are expecting 1,200 attendees from around the world and 180 international speakers. To see who is coming to DLD Munich, visit our website at dld.co and apply for your ticket. In last week's pod, I offered five takeaways in response to my conversation with John Borthwick. A number of people have told me that they enjoyed this feature, so I've decided to make it a permanent part of the show. I've even got a name for it, Andrew's Five Takeaways. Clever, eh? Five takeaways, then, in what I thought was a really provocative conversation with David Goodhart. The first is that Goodhart's distinction between somewheres and everywheres is a really critical one. He's right to suggest that the major cleavage in today's democracies is between an increasingly mobile global elite and a lower class of more settled people. That's the socio-geography of today's advanced democracies. It's what explains everything from Brexit and Trump to Viktor Orban. And it's this somewhere-everywhere division that explains how people view contemporary politics and even the very idea of democracy. So I strongly advise you to have a look at his 2017 bestseller, The Road to Somewhere. It's a great read. Secondly, he may also be correct about the relatively good health of democracy. After all, The revolt of the somewheres against the ruling anywhere establishment is, in many ways, self-evident proof of the workings of a successful democracy. And so today's populist upheavals actually reveal a strength rather than a weakness with contemporary democracy. Liberals might not like the people's will, 
But that's their problem, not democracies. Third, I'm sympathetic to Goodhart's critique of the arrogance of today's all-powerful global liberal elite. He's right to identify them as a new aristocracy who believe that everyone should share their globalist outlook and values. This is the Hillary Clinton paradox of the wealthy liberal espousing a cult of openness and toleration while simultaneously looking down on everyone else. It's the basket of deplorables paradox. This is a really critical question for the future of democracy, which we'll come back to time and time again in this series. Yes, elites matter, even in our supposedly democratized networked age. And perhaps the best way to strengthen democracy in the 21st century is by rebuilding the legitimacy of our contemporary elites. Fourth, I think he's right to worry about the distribution of status in our networked age. Whereas the factory worker or miner had a certain kind of respect in the industrial age, what Goodhart refers to as the dignity of labor hasn't, unfortunately, been inherited in today's Uber driver or call center operator world. There's too much respect for head and not enough for heart in our modern democracy, Goodhart correctly argues. That said, however, I didn't hear anything really concrete from him on how to recalibrate status in an age of growing ressentiment. I hope future guests on this show will offer real solutions to this vital issue for the future of democracy. Last, but certainly not least, there's one big problem with David Goodhart's presentation. For all his smart socio-economic and political observations, he mostly shies away from moral judgments about the ideology of the somewheres, particularly their attitude towards outsiders and immigrants. And his unwillingness to genuinely critique what's going on in Poland or Hungary is particularly troubling. If Goodhart really is, as he claims, a champion of liberal democracy, then he should be much more outspoken about the overt racism and anti-Semitism of neo-authoritarian leaders like Viktor Orban. One thing that David Goodhart didn't really address was the impact of technology, particularly digital technology, on democracy. Next week, we focus on this issue with Ken Kukie, a New York Times best-selling author on technology and business and the big data editor at The Economist. I look forward to talking with you then.